I want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quignano Show. Tom Luongo's back. What's going on, Tom? How are you, Pete? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> every, good. every 24 hours is, uh, you know, is it's something new, right? Well, I hit you up about this uh, before, I mean, probably 30, 35 hours ago. And right. everything could have changed since then. Right. But um, one, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on was because so much is going on in Europe that I know that you're, you're the guy to talk to about Europe and you're, you, it, at least I know that you'll have a, an educated guess on what <laughs> you think is happening. So um, I guess the first thing we can talk about is um, the prime minister of Ireland, just up in, up in retires. Up, steps yeah. Down. Uh, yeah. The, 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 so the, a number of things came together, I think, all at once. And when this thing blindsided me yesterday morning or Wednesday morning, yeah, well, yesterday morning, like, sorry, I can't, for some reason, I all, all of a sudden thought it was Friday. Um, and uh, uh, about, you know, half an hour before I was due to record for my patrons, which I do every Wednesday morning, right? And um, I just threw it up there and I'm like, okay, this is, I know this is important. I know this is big. This is a big deal, right? But I don't quite know what i think is happening here and i just i said i threw it up to the to the to the community to say you know come on let's let's do a little brainstorming i mean i i, I filibustered for 15 minutes or so but uh what i'll say is this like brad kerr or whatever however you say his name um it was a you know another one of these um ultra devotions that were put in that was put in power in order to advance you know the 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 technocratic more tech more perfect technocratic union that they're building over in Europe. And he's been there um, dutifully, you know, running their agenda for him. And he lost uh, a couple of weeks ago, he lost a major attempt to wokeify the Irish constitution. Um, and that lost badly. And now, you know, when you lose, you know, no matter, no matter what happens in a parliamentary system and you're the guy that pushes forward a thing, and it gets soundly rebuked by your own parliament, and you're supposed to be the guy in power with the with the uh, the coalition that's supposed to be that's supposed to back you. Like you knew something that badly, that already puts you on thin ice politically. Then apparently he was at the White House what on Tuesday, um, and and did the dutiful Davos thing of saying to um, to Joe Biden that uh, he would not you know, stop supporting Israel. I'm not sorry. He was not sorry. Stop supporting Palestine. Now I take a very cynical view of everything that's occurring with Israel and Palestine. Okay. This is all high level strategic political speak. This is not my personal opinion about, you know, whether or not there's a, a I don't want to see anybody getting killed. I, I have the same position on, on, on this as I do Ukraine or anything else, right? Um, the killing, it would be nice if the killing would fucking stop. Full stop. It would be great. No one wants to see anybody else die. But taking it out of that moral framework, because this is not a moral framework discussion. This is a political framework discussion. And therefore, it's an amoral pol <laughs> um, yep. framework uh, for discussion. I map Netanyahu to old British Israeli um, neoconservative uh, impulses or incentives, power structure. I map his opposition in Israel to Europe. Europe wants and still wants, even though they say otherwise, they still want access to cheap energy procured overseas um, at pennies on the dollar. They're still neo-colonialists or they're still colonialists at heart. Okay. France is hopping mad that they're losing control over their colonies in you know, in North Africa or Central Africa, um, the JCPOA, you can, if you sit down and you go back over the Iran um, uh, nuclear deal, the JCPOA, and you realize that, Netanyahu was against it because this was a means by which Europe would get access to cheap Iranian energy. 
go back and remember that it was Total, the French energy state energy company, that signed the first major exploration deal with Iran after the JCPOA was signed. Okay. So when you you put all that together, right? Varadkar maps to Davos in Europe. Um, so Davos maps to backing Palestine, back Palestinians against the Israelis, against Netanyahu's, you know, purge of the Palestinians. Whether or not Netanyahu is justified in this and anything, that's beyond my 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 purview here. I'm not here to, to comment on that one way or the other. If you want an opinion from me about that, tough. I'm not going to do it today simply because it's not about that's not what we're talking about here. So um now the Biden administration is a very interesting problem, conundrum, because it's it on many things maps many issues maps directly to Davos. And on other things, you know, it's also a nest of freaking traditional neoconservatives. The whole National Security Council and State Department have been staffed with the worst Clintonista neocons. Jake Sullivan, Anthony Blinken, formerly Victoria Nuland, yada, yada, yada. Like, so what do you, so what can you say about that? Well, here's what I, I think is going on here. Well, part of what I think is going on. The neocons were put in charge by Davos to run the war in Ukraine, right, in order to pressure Russia. It was their project because they're the ones that built it. They're the ones that built Ukraine and all of this stuff. But never forget that Europe was okay with the idea of fighting a war in Russia as long as we paid for it and we ultimately fought it. But the minute it became too big a cost for them, they were no longer interested in it. Or more appropriately, the more the minute we were no longer willing to bankrupt ourselves and commit ritualistic fucking suicide as a country, meaning the United States, they lost their minds. So firing Victoria Nuland from the State Department set a lot of dominoes in motion because all of a sudden Europe is left with a war that they've picked against Russia. They're committed to it. And the United States is like, you know what? No. And then the second front opens up with Israel and Palestinians in October. And they thought they were going to be able to run that and they're running that game as well. And Netanyahu saying no. And so now the Biden administration is trying to slow everyone's role in, um, in, in the Middle East, but at the same time for doing what Davos wants them to do, i.e. get a ceasefire. And, you know, everybody's lined up across the board on, on this front because it looks bad because now it just flat out looks bad. Now Europe just looks like the ones aggressing in Europe, uh, aggressing in, in Ukraine, pushing things forward. The Americans are backing away and they've got the Americans basically talking out of both sides of their mouth in the Middle East. And now it's an untenable situation, an untenable shit show for everybody politically and, and reputationally around the world. So um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm laying aside a whole bunch of other issues that, that go along with this. This is a good opening salvo. But I think ultimately, you know, Varadkar stood there and said, I wasn't going to bow to Joe Biden over support for Palestine. But he was on his way out the door anyway, because he had already lost the confidence of his um, his coalition. I think that's probably as close as a good take on this that I can come up with at this point as possible. I, I don't know, you know, free associate from there. Well, yes, yeah, some of the more interesting things that were happening um, yesterday was um, Obama was in London. OK, mm -hmm. um, uh, Van der Leeuwen is they're trying to sell war bonds to von der Leyen, yeah, get. Yeah. And is that how do you pronounce the name? Von der Leyen. Von der Leyen. Or, and, you know, or, or, you know, Van der Leyen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're trying, they're also trying to freeze Russian assets. Mm -hmm. And then you have, then you have Macron who, yeah. I mean, you want to talk about sand in his mangina. The guy, mm -hmm. I have no idea what this, what he's thinking. 
Um, what do you think that is? Is that is that Davos? Is that is he? I mean, he's an old Rothschild, uh, Rothschild banker. Mm-hmm. So I mean, if he's being run by anybody, he's being run by the guys in London. So that's right. that's what my, that's my assumption. Well, I guess you know, my you see the thing is, is that I don't you know I, I Pete. One of the weird things about this is remember I don't I don't map any one um country to any one particular faction like i think there are multiple i think there are representatives of each quote-unquote faction within each country so there's a davos faction in the u.s that's clearly a davos faction within the uk centered around tony blair and david cameron and um the the civil service and city of london and then and parts of the british parts of the british royal family specifically i would say king charles but there are others that don't map to that and I, and I'm not firmly convinced of this, but you know, for my for my money, um, Elizabeth II was a, a British sovereigntist first, and was angling towards you know she I I firmly believe that she backed Brexit, and um, you know she did her best to navigate the political waters of not of 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 ma- maintaining her neutrality while you know putting her thumb on the scale. The way she, you know, in the way that she was allowed, basically politically, and I think she was removed. And I think there was a coup um, around that time. You know, they got rid of Liz Trust, they got rid of uh, Queen Elizabeth. They, you know, BlackRock made its uh, made its uh, move on the Bank of England. Blah blah blah. Right? I'm not even sure where the Bank of England falls in all of this at this point. I mean, I'm it, it, everything. We don't. We know. We're all speculating with really imperfect information. So. You know, you know, everybody listening, I'm not married to most of these things. And when I do, and when I, I put these things out there, just remember that I'm bracketing with like high probability, not with confidence, right? Just to, to remind you, this is my, my most likely thinking on this. This is the most likely scenario. That doesn't mean it's true or that I'm convinced of it unless you know, there are certain things I'm convinced of, but um, I haven't, none of the stuff I've talked about so far am I convinced of? So, well, I, I, I believe that Davos is behind Netanyahu's opposition in Israel. I believe that, you know, David Cameron is a globalist, right? Uh, of a, of the quote unquote Davosian stripe. So Macron is absolutely like the high priest of Davos in European, he and von der Leyen together. And I'll be honest with you. I've always seen Macron as, and France as the pivotal, country in this because they're the ones trying to to they're the ones working the hardest to undermine italy within a within european um politics and within uh, uh within you know within european politics um far more than germany is at this point uh and in some ways you know they're the ones that absolutely want to be the the weapons the the head of the military industrial complex of europe in a post kind of nato environment which is they're clearly angling for that um so and and I think France has the most to lose because look them and the English got us involved in a war with Germany in 19 teens called World War One that the United States had to bail them out of. Then they did it again in the 1930s, 1940s, and this little conflict called World War Two. By the way, Winston Churchill was, you know, the guy behind both of those, and they clearly want World War Three. And they want the Americans to bail them out this time as well. And like, this is the time when, you know, it's very clear, I think, that they're definitely feeling a, a, you know, this kind of existential threat that if the United States pulls out and pivots, pulls out of Europe, because they can't, because they know your NATO really doesn't have the army or the, the means to quote unquote fight Russia without going nuclear, which nobody wins that. So that's an, I mean, that's a non-starter other than, you know, psychopaths taking everybody to the hell rather than lose, which is, you know, it's a possibility, but I don't think it's the scenario they actually want. Um, they're, they're freaking out over the United States telling you where they were, we're pulling out of Europe. We're going to leave you to your own devices. We're going to leave you to Putin and we're pivoting to China. And, um, you know. And we're going to do it with Trump and we're okay. And, and in many ways, it almost feels like at this point, we are okay with 
it being Trump and that there are forces within the United States that have pre previously been against Trump that are now going, you know, I can live with Trump if Trump's going to pivot to China. And I, that's what I see happening. And, uh, you know, again, the new one thing, Nikki Haley dropping out, even though she wasn't supposed to, like there's all sorts of stuff going on here. So, and then Davos is clearly calling in every marker imaginable to undermine what's left of the rule of law um, and uh, our, our, uh, our reputation for handling and handling capital well. Like that project hasn't changed. Now, so Elizabeth Warren with the wealth tax stuff and um, the, the, the judgment against Trump in uh, New York and they're going to you know, seize all of his assets in New York to pay for the stupid fine, which is a bill of attainder, which is clearly unconstitutional and all of this stuff. Like this is all Davos. This is all a very Davos thing. And this is all absolute revenge for the United States trying to declare independence from these fucking people. And that's just the way I see it. So, and Macron is, you know, literally trying to create a poison pill in Europe that kind of an article, I think he's trying to create an article five scenario to force the United States to fight a war that they don't want to fight or prepare well, to fight. If, one of the things you, you texted yesterday was you said that um, you believe that a lot of this has to do with the Supreme Court ruling that Trump will, um, you know, that Trump can run, that Trump will be mm -hmm. on the ballot. That and, was the inside it, incident. Yeah. Is, does it seem, I mean, was that Newland leaving? Was that, um, was that the Irish prime minister stepping down? I don't know how secure Rishi Sunak's job is. I, it's not. Um, it's not at all. If when Sunak was the last steps time, down, when was the last time anyone saw Prince Charles? Right. Why is Kate Middleton disappearing? What mm -hmm. What's going on? I mean, right, it, well, it, that, I mean, Sunak is is a, is a Davos plant as well, right? I mean, they get rid of his trust. They put in Rishi Sunak, a guy who's the, the, yeah, yet another yet another British prime minister who wasn't un unelected. This is very much a Davos thing that you know we will never go back to an election if we don't have to if we can get our guy if we can get our guy involved the only time there's ever an election in a place is when they're going to try and you know when it's scheduled and they can't avoid it um but you know or they can manipulate events to get what they want so you know sunak was supposed to be their guy you know they put david cameron back in charge of what defense was he defense minister now right or foreign minister yeah right I mean, no, David Cameron, who's, who was politically dead after Brexit. And now all of a sudden he's back in, you know, in British politics. Or, or I mean, am I supposed to, am I supposed to believe this is air we're breathing? Like, yeah, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah, foreign commonwealth and development affairs. Yeah, okay. I mean, the fact that he's in the, the, the fact that any, and he's in any official capacity speaking for the, the for the UK is clear evidence that, the Brits are not, in effect, in charge of their own government at this point. And so Obama going to 10 Downing Street, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot a lot to un, unra uh, un, unpack there. The, the, those that see everything in terms of the U.S. as the evil empire and Europe isn't, see it as Obama is going to, you know, 10 Downing Street to let the British know what the what the business is and i'm like yeah maybe not it could just as easily be oh by the way charles is dead um we're getting rid of sunak we've gotten rid of varadkar we got rid of nick uh, we've already gotten rid of nicholas sturgeon in scotland by the way there's all there's a new sheriff in town and you've been summoned barack because you're no longer in charge and that would be the read from your your PayPal mafia group and from my New York boys Powell Federal Reserve. If if you if you buy either of our theses about yours, the PayPal mafia, mine about Powell and the New York boys, then that's Obama going and getting new marching orders. If you don't buy into that, then it's Davos sending Obama. Why would they send Obama? They're already in charge of 10 Downing Street. You know, because Obama is their boy. You know, Obama doesn't work for the Chinese and he doesn't work for the Russians. He's an American trader that works for the Europeans. And he always has. Okay. So 
you know, they're already in charge of 10 Downing Street. Why the hell do they need to summon Obama for? Unless yeah. there's, you know, unless they're, you know, worried that, you know, unless they're trying to figure out a way to coordinate what's left of, you know, what they're going to pull off next. Unless what they were actually doing is in the last ditch gasp, a last gasp effort to coordinate whatever other shoe is going to drop in order to stop what is happening from happening. Meaning all of this pushback that they're getting across all of these other, these vectors that we've just we've just mapped out, what's their next move? Right? That's the big question now. Like, well, how do they, ha- I mean, if you're them, if you put yourself in Davos' shoes, you ask, okay, what, how do we get out of this? What do we do? Oh, well, you escalate again, right? I, I was, I've been thinking about this a lot and I was, and, you know, for the last few days and I've been saying to my wife and hell, I even said it to my therapist yesterday. I said, look, I have this creeping feeling of dread that something bad is about to happen. Like something really bad. Ron Paul just Ron Paul just said that on uh, Tucker Carlson. He said, "Right, that he, I didn't have I didn't have a chance to listen to, to watch that yet." Yeah, he um, said, "Expect I, the Black Swan event." Yeah, exactly. Oh, I did hear. I did hear that. I, I just marvel at the fact that Ron Paul can still do two hours and forty five minutes with Tucker Carlson and, at his age. He's just, yeah, he's indefatigable. He's just he's an amazing, amazing human being, right? And um, an even longer interview than Putin gave him for Christ's sake, right? Um, and uh, so I, I'm feeling the same thing that Ron's feeling. And when I, I map this, right. If you've, you know, I've played games of go and games of chess where, okay. You watch two really great players, you know, bind the board up by making move, counter, move, move, counter, move. And then the board kind of almost is, 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 is it looks like everything's kind of bound up and the game's like not going anywhere. And then all of a sudden somebody makes the mistake and un balances the board and then we spiral towards end game and that's a that's an imperfect metaphor because like this is like this is not a two-player game right this is a five six seven player game as i when i was at the ron paul conference and you and i first met personally a couple of years ago i described it as a seven player game of go it's more better mapped as like a game of uh, a classic game of diplomacy or dune or something along those lines it's classic board games where you got four five six people fighting for you know you know control and it's a finely balanced situation until somebody finally makes a move that's beyond their skill like you've got people at the table and the game has gotten has progressed to a level where one player at the table doesn't understand the nuance that's you know in in effect and makes a makes a move that is like a like a like a fart in a phone booth and all the other players at the table go, dude, what the fuck did you just do? You just handed him, you just handed the game to him. And then somebody else screams, no, you handed it to this guy. No, you handed the game to that guy. And they're all start screaming at each other. I know I've been in this game, by the way, many, many times. We're all screaming at each other that this guy made the terrible, made a terrible move because we all can't see the ending. And I think that that's part of where we are right now. Like, I know that's what I'm feeling, that I can see that somebody made a big move here. And it's the game is spiraling towards a conclusion, at least this phase of the game, or this bird, you know, this 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 act in the movie or whatever. And we're just like we're at that moment and we're gonna spiral to that, but we don't know how this is gonna come out. And so it's you know, everybody's really confused. And um I think I, I think that that's probably the the fairest and most generous read on this at this point. Don't, you know. I, I won't stand here and tell you who I think is going to win. I don't know. You know, somebody asked me this morning, where in the whole Star Wars canon do you think we are right now? Episode four, episode five, episode, where are we? It's like Andor. Like the rebellion <laughs> is forming and the Empire is striking. You know, you know I think the, Emp- the, the rebellion is still like in its infancy. We're still very early in this game, you know? Um, so How bad off? How bad off do you think the World Economic Forum? How how bad off do you think they are right now? Are they are they so bad off that they're in panic mode? Are they so bad off that they have one of their agents running around out there talking about sending armies to, you know, sending Frenchmen to die in Ukraine? Yes, and use them as tripwire troops in order to get NATO involved all the way. Absolutely, absolutely, I do believe that. 
but I also believe that the neocons feel just as desperate. So they're going to go along with it. And you can see that from the polls and the way the yeah. polls react and everything. Well, what's the point of Israel basically alienating the whole world except for, you know, London and, and Washington, D.C.? And, yeah, I mean, we, we, I think we they, know a lot I, has I, to I, do with this trade routes. You know, I, 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 um, I think that Israel has, is alienating D.C. Because Washington doesn't want, Washington wants a, a political solution. This isn't a political problem for the Israelis, nor is it a political problem for the Muslims in the, in the region um, or anybody else. This is a religious, eschatological problem for them. This is a bigger game than that. Okay. And I don't have a, I don't, I can't speak chapter and verse to this. Like, um, cause it's not really my area of expertise. I'm being educated on it slowly by, you know, members of my community and, and, and whatnot. Oh, but yeah. Just, everybody prepare themselves because I've already heard this. Yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not about to uh, go into details on this one. I'm not gonna go crazy. Oh, I, would. If I do, I would. No, if I, cause I do, I'm going to go way out over my skis and it's going to be crazy, but I just want you to, to, to think of that, about this in terms of, of Islamic eschatology and how that factors into Jewish eschatology and how that factors into Christian eschatology and it all, uh, and, and none of it ends well. And, um, but it does run back. There is a straight line back to Putin. Yes, there is. And because... there is, a, and there, and there is a, you know, if you want to believe the voting numbers that come out of, uh, came out of Russia, right. 99% of Chechens voted for Putin. Yes. That's a perfect example of what I'm about to say, which is that when you when you when you start to look at the the way this 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 thing is laying out, um, I'm just going to relate part of the story of the the part of this is the the within Islamic eschatology from what I understand. And again, I'm not an expert on this, so do your you know do your own. I'm gonna I'm gonna like do the Wall Street thing here. Do your own due diligence. Yada yada yada. Um, that this is the story of Gog and Magog, and that and that and that that's the fight that they're involved in at this point. Gog and Magog are are the forces of and effectively the forces of evil here, and they've teamed up and they're the United States and the Brits, uh, or the West in various in some form or another, and that there's the um, there's the the character of Dual Carnain who is the one who fought them once in uh in the caucuses the first time but he's the man who has multiple um incarnations or two man who lives in two different times and that the way the muslims are beginning to see putin as the incarnation of dual carnet which is why the chechens were so rabidly willing to go in and root out the um the right sector guys in Mariupol they were again they were desperate to prove to Putin that they were his ally because they see the parallels within um and within the prophecies of of the Quran as to with this period in time today and and how that relates to why Netanyahu is pushing for his end game for the sec, you know, um, his end game because you know they want the rapture, and that means building the third temple and you know destroying like and and everything that Netanyahu has done has you know signified this now whether or not this is being done in order to create you know these events and I you know like, it, like that's a it's a and it create these events in people's minds. I don't know. Okay. But what I know is that it's a very interesting framework with which to see this. And I know that Alistair Crook has talked about the, uh, the eschatology here as well, mostly from the Jewish perspective. You go read his work over at strategic culture and you can listen to his, uh, interviews that he's done with the, uh, with judge Knapp recently. And, and he's gone into some of this as well. And I think it's very, I think it's a, an important side of this and why the, why Netanyahu's not going to back down 
and why he's going to poke this and he's going to keep going to keep poking this snake until he gets the United States to back him wholeheartedly about this because that's his only chance at quote unquote winning. And um, you know, I, now he's lost. Now he's lost American. You know, now the Democratic Party has lost uh, American Jews. And Chuck Schumer is now, you know, against Netanyahu. When did this? When did this happen? Mm-hmm. Right. It's it's just everything is spiraling to a very very weird conclusion. Um, so just you know, again, I'm not here to you know, I I I, I want to caution everybody about my take on this, but I, I think I've got it mostly correct in the way it's been presented to me, and Putin. The the Muslim world understands that all Putin has to do to win is survive, and they will do everything they can to support him in that in that uh, endeavor. And then whether or not the quote unquote secular Muslims probably who and I would say someone like Erdogan or Erdogan is uh, one of those, um, you know, where he may as a wild card in all of this lay out. Right. Because if he gets what he wants politically for Turkey or what if he gets if he just gets to kill Kurds, he'll be happy. You know what I mean? Like so there's a lot of wild cards here. And there's a lot of um, you know, nothing here is set in stone. But you know, the what I'm trying to describe is the way certain people see other what way certain factions see other factions. So in this case, the way the Muslims see Putin and so that point about 99% of Chechens voting for Putin doesn't surprise me at all. At all. So Iran, where does Iran fit into all of this? The, I mean, it's obvious that Israel wants, wants Iran destroyed. If Israel yeah. wants Iran destroyed, then DC obviously wants Iran destroyed because APAC has control over DC. And even as people, even as d- Democrats are abandoning Israel, mm-hmm. they're still ha- they still have their eyes on Iran. Yeah. So I so know. where does if the if the Iran hate isn't if the if the focus on Iran isn't coming from from only the Israeli side, uh, where else is it coming from and why? Well. From I mean, a we secular, know the British from, we, from a we secular know the, perspective, yeah. taking all the religious stuff out of it, Iran is the crossroads of, for in in very broad terms, the international north south transport corridor from Saint Petersburg to the port Chabahar, and Belt and Road, the the overland route of Belt and Road from you know basically Beijing to um to the Persian Gulf, right, or in Turkey. So without Iran, there is no east west land corridor for trade. And without Iran, there is no north-south transport corridor for Russia to get their goods to the rest of the world. So from a purely geostrategic perspective, Iran is the focal point of, you know, the, 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 without any religious overtones whatsoever. And this would then be, this would then map to, you know, old Mackinder heartland theory about, you know, controlling the world island and all the rest of it and about the british through the americans continuing to you know uh control the maritime sea routes around the breadbasket of the world which is the middle east um and access to europe but at the same time europe is bankrupting themselves and now desperately trying to break down the western financial order by seizing russia's foreign exchange reserves and handing them to ukraine there's a pure provocation it's a cheap provocation intended to get the russians to go offside and go on tilt if you want to use a poker analogy i the more i watch this play out and the more i listen to putin talk and the more i think uh, more i watch what's what i'm seeing on the ground and in, in, in ukraine i am not ruling out the russians just replicating what they did in february of 2022 and bl- trying to blitzkrieg Kiev again from Belarus because at this moment in time, no one could stop them if they wanted to. 
So now what? Or the Russians just move a whole bunch of troops into the into the center line and push from the center in the Donbass. But then that really just gets them up to the Dnieper River and secures the Donbass. But and then there's the what are the Russians going to do in Odessa? And I'll, you know, I, I would argue that the Russians haven't proved to anybody that they can do what they need to do to take Odessa at this point. Um, given the swampland that is that area of the world, right? The geography there is just terrible from, you know, from Zaporizhia points west. Um, so Mikolaev out to, uh, out to Odessa, you know, they're not, I, I don't see the, the Russians doing, you know, amphibious operations into Odessa. Like, are they have any ships left? You know, I mean, let's, let's be, let's be realistic here. That's not what I see. So then it, you know, then the, so from that perspective, while Odessa is clearly a strategic goal for the Russians, denying Odessa to the Russians is also a strategic goal for the West. If I'm, you know, if I'm Putin's, you know, military advisors at this point, while the West dithers about sending troops and money and everything else to Ukraine, Kiev becomes a very val, very um, potential, you know, it just it seems like a very obvious target to me. But I don't know. But, you know, I also, we're also going to, we're going to get into the spring thaw real soon. So, you know, hostilities in, in that area of the world are going to stop for a couple of months while this, well, you know, while the mud dries up, yada, yada, yada. When you take into consideration everything that Powell's been able to do to the Euro and, you know, basically it's just a full on attack on Davos. Um, what effect do you think that has on basically all these countries joining BRICS, you know, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, all these you know, Muslim countries, it seems like people are just lining up now to join BRICS that they mm -hmm. want to be in that partnership. Does that is obviously if they're doing that, they see the America fl falling away and they see the rise of a, um, of Russia, China, India, um, right. Or they is that just bad forecasting on their part, or you know what do you what do you think? No, I I think that what you're seeing out of Europe is duplicity, mendacity, well, all of those words lying for those of you who don't like the truck and you know twenty five cent words, um, and untrustworthiness, not agreement capable, and to put it in Putin's terms, and because of that, um, you know, hey. And again, no better example of that kind of of, uh, of behavior than wanting to seize Russia's foreign exchange reserves that we've frozen. And I and I and I and I I've gotten pushback from people on this and say, well, what's the difference? We've already frozen the assets. What's the big deal? It was a huge difference between freezing the assets, even for thirty or forty years, like we did to the Iranians back in the seventies. But we've still peace parceled the money back out to them. And then the conservatives take the bait and go, oh, see, Obama's giving money back to the Iranians. Uh, yeah, dude, it's their money. And Obama maps to freaking Davos and they're, they're trying to build a relationship with Iran. Like this is all, you're just being manipulated into believing that it's, you know, Israel versus that Iran is bad and Israel good and secret the, Muslim. It, 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 none, of, none of this is, and none of that is real. This is about the British trying to maintain control over the Suez Canal. Okay? And like this is what this is about. So all the rest of it is just, you know, you being gaslit by, you know, narcissists. Um, Breitbart. <laughs> and Breitbart, yeah, for lack of a better term at this point. You know, they've become a fucking cartoon, haven't they? So, like, um, the from that perspective, yes, you know, why wouldn't you want to line up with the people who are have that, that, you know, when they send their diplomats in to negotiate and they send their, you know, and they said to train negotiators and to negotiate, they negotiate deals and then they honor those deals. Hmm. What a novel concept that is. And that's all the Russians are doing is sending Lavrov in to just, you know, cut deals and then honor them. Like, you know, holy shit. What a novel concept, right?
I'm getting the fucking vapors over here. So like, and on the other side, we're not doing any of that. We're just beating people over the head and saying, no, you have to do what we, what we tell you to do. And, and when I watch us do that, when I know that it's not to our advantage to doing it, then I know it's a fucking operation. And I know it's a fucking operation for someone else trying to undermine us to undermine our validity as a world actor. Now I'm talking specifically about the United States. And then I have to ask the question, okay, then who, who do these people work for? Do they work for the Chinese? I eh, maybe, but the more obvious answer is that they work for Europe because Europe's the one, Europe's the sick man at the table that needs people to still believe in them. And how do you make them believe in them? How do you make people believe in the validity of Europe by making, by bringing the United States down and then by relatively speaking, Europe looks better or that at least capital doesn't flee Europe and, and, and whatnot. And then you put controls around capital fleeing Europe and you make it, you make it, and you just keep raising the, the stakes to make it difficult. And that's, what's been going on here. And it's been going on for a long, long time. So, but, um, but that you can't stop the rest of the, the, the world from going and I'm going to side with the guys who, you know, don't abuse me and, you know, tell me the truth and honor their deals. And that's kind of what's happening while we keep, you know, while the West keeps, you know, just abusing people and then wondering why they, you know, don't listen. You know, I just keep saying over and over and over again, the, the beatings will continue until morale improves. And, you know, that's nice, but we don't have to do, we don't have to do this. They have options. They have alternatives. And they haven't had those in the past. Is it Russia or China having Niger drive the United States out of there? It's the Russians. It's absolutely the Russians. Wagner is there. I mean, it's the Russians. Yeah. And that's fine. You know, it, look, we chose to play in that space. You know, this is about this is and this is about Russia protecting their market share in the European gas markets. And this is, you know, and at the end of the day, the the, the Europeans are gonna have to go back to buying Russian gas, whether they like it or not. But what the Europeans always wanted, Pete. And I've taught, I've, I've written extensively about this, not recently, but I wrote extensively about this in like 2019, 2020, about how Europe views their trade relations with the rest of the world. They believe that they are the indispensable buyer of service. Doesn't matter what it is. They are the ind indispensable market. You can't do it. You can't build a business without the European market. So therefore you're, we're going to put such controls on you for the, the, to, uh, allow you the privilege of selling your goods to us. This is the way they act, that you have to act in this, this, and this, this way. You have to put these rules in place. You have to join these organizations and change your tax code. And it's all this OECD bullshit, right? And it's all designed just to make everybody as bad as Europe. And then raise our cost of production to the point where we sell their our goods to them below our cost. That's what they want. They're just fucking colonials. They're just colonial. They're just mercantilists, colonialists, whatever you want to call them. And, you know, Putin's big sin is that he refuses to sell them gas, you know, at prices below his cost of production. That's his big sin. Yeah. People don't want to believe that they're still colonialists. And then you remind them of South Africa and the Oppenheimers and, you know, and the Rothschilds. And you're like, um, well, I mean, you think they just gave up on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you think they, you think they didn't? You, why do you think? Why would you ever think that they got? This is why George Maloney, you know, educating the world about the CFA Frank, the the colonial Frank that there's used in the 14 countries all across the Sahel region of of Central Africa, was such a was such a big deal. Like, I'm sorry, you know, and again, I, I'm not sure what to make of Maloney at this point. I think she's in a very difficult position, and you know. And her her te her tenure in Italy has been um, been difficult to handicap. But she remind. But so much of what I see out of Maloney just reminds me of Trump. Like she's bound down eighteen different ways from Sunday, and she has to make deals with bad people, and she has to put, she has to do all these terrible. You know, has to do a whole bunch of things that, that are fundamentally against what she ran on. And guess what? That's what they did to Trump. And today, I'm, I'm we're still having to fight people who believe that Trump is no better than Biden and that, you know, because he ran with 
Bolton and Pompeo and Haspel and all these horrible people in this, I'm like, in this administration. I'm like, I'm like arguing with people. Like, I still argue with people about this today because it's like, oh, well, if you don't understand how American politics works, that Mitch McConnell was in charge of, you know, who got to be secretary of state and who got to be run the CIA and not the president. Well, then you just don't understand. Then you're just a child and shut, you should shut the fuck up. And that's just that simple. And this is where my dander gets up because I'm like, oh, that's nice. I'm being lectured by a limey or a German or somebody else, you know, or somebody else about, about American politics, about how terrible Trump is. I'm like, why don't you go fuck yourself and call it even? Because you don't understand a goddamn thing about American politics. Now, where when I get out over my skis about German politics or British politics, you're more than welcome to tell me to shut the fuck up. Like, okay, explain to me why I'm wrong. But I've done, you know, but I've done unbelievable amounts of work to, un to educate myself about British politics and about German politics in order to be able to speak about it in a way that is intelligent, right? I don't get that from, I don't get that coming back the other way about American politics. Everybody seems to think that they understand American politics all around the world, and they don't. Americans they don't, don't understand American politics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, so... No, like we we have a system that's alien to European parliamentary systems. It's it it looks like it, you think it looks like us, like you, but it isn't at all. Just like Americans are really confused about European parliamentary systems. You know, when I explain shit about like the German, the the German political structure and why the Greens, with you know fifteen percent of the vote, can control the entire German government as the minority party in the coalition they don't understand and, and i didn't understand it until i was it was explained to me by a german but how the german upper house is literally you know can be can be brought to a standstill by you know like seven people having one vote in a plurality of german um state caucuses because the the bunda for example because the bundesrat the German upper house doesn't vote individually. The 67, there aren't 67 votes. There are however many states there are in Germany. That's how many votes there are. The The state's vote is a block. So if the Greens hold their nose and refuse and just veto everything, then they can like shut down everything. And that's what they've been doing. And Merkel designed it that way before she, and she, and then she walked off the scene after she, after she pulled this off. So I understand why the German political system works the way it does. And why, even if Scholz's coalition were to fall, nothing will change until there's until the next German um, uh, general election. You know, that's why it was important that they got what they why Davos got what they got. If Trump is elected, does he have enough people around him to tell him and to initiate the? dismantling of what they call nato which really it doesn't really exist anymore it's just right. a yeah it's just an excuse basically um does he does he have enough will or do people around him are people around him going to have enough will to um make sure nato doesn't exist anymore the, the even the idea of it i don't know um i, I don't know um I, I i'd like to believe that i honestly think that Europe doesn't want NATO anymore. They just want us to fight the Russians until the point where we, we it, they want a couple of things out of us. They want us to fight the Russians and lose not that, but bleed Russia out in the process. So that's such a bloody battle that we're both weakened to the point where it doesn't matter anymore. And they then want they us can to be Ukraine. Out, right. What's that? They want us to be Ukraine. Yeah, and, they, and, yeah. And, and, and in many ways. And then they can turn around and go, see, the Americans aren't a good enough you know, aren't good enough and that we need to have our own system. You'll also note that there's, that they're trying to put their guys in charge of NATO as well. Like Mark Ruta as the head, as the general secretary of NATO, like that's a Davos move directly. Then we're going to put Mark Ruta in charge of NATO. And, uh, you know, but we Americans are still supposed to pay for the whole thing and fight and die, and you know, for a war that Macron started. Did I mean? Did did, did y'all not see the 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 story that these people are setting up? And but America is the big bad guy, right? Oh, okay, 
Like that's again, you're being gaslit by this. When the truth of the matter is, is that if Hillary Clinton had been elected in 2016, the war in Ukraine would have started in 2017. Okay. There would have been a no fly zone over Syria and there would have been world war three in Syria and Ukraine in 2017. But yet Trump is the bad guy because he didn't st- he didn't dismantle it all because he wasn't good enough. No, he wasn't good enough, but he forestalled it for four years. He left, he, he put that situation. He put that, that war off until 2022. And by then, you know, that gave, honestly, that gave Putin more than enough time to build the weapon systems necessary and the drone systems and everything else necessary to be able to fight the war he needed to fight in Ukraine. And he's, that's how he's, why he's doing it now. Uh, and why he's got the, the threats that he has. And, um, you can even go back to the, to the Russian state of the union address in March of 2018, when he unveiled all these new weapon systems, whether you believe he has, you know, large installations of them or not large, you know, stockpiles of these weapons or not, or even if they, any half of them even work is irrelevant. I can tell you that from that moment forward, the neocons were like, we need to attack Russia immediately. They went completely off their rocker. Like everything changed after the Russian um, State of the Union address in 2018. So, you know, that was happening and all Trump was doing was forestalling it. But that's enough. Like, again, if you, it gave us enough time to respond to it, then they had to unveil COVID, then they had to do this, then they had to do all these other things. And so it's a different world than it would have been had they started this in 2017. So give Trump credit for whatever, for what he did, which is he didn't start any new wars. And, you know, was he perfect? No. Will he be perfect as, you know, in the second term? No. And do I, you know, but will he pull us out of NATO if NATO does something really dumb? I think he's just enough of an asshole to do that. But will he be able to? Good question. But then again, given the state of affairs, Trump entering the White House in January next year would be such a monumental event in and of itself and a monumental piece of evidence that, for lack of a better term, sovereignist forces within the United States have the upper hand. Upper hand, not control, upper hand. That maybe, just maybe, that'll be enough. I don't know. You know, this is this is a this is a very this is a this is this is the, it's not a step function, folks. You don't get the guy elected and then all of a sudden everything, ooh, we yay, we all won. And it's like the end of Star Wars, we blew up the uh the Death Star and now the world's a better place. Remember like the that that the next movie was the Empire Strikes Back. Like, you know what I mean? Like it took they had to kill the they had to kill the Death Star a second time in order to win. Right. You know, like it's a process. This is a thing that happens over time. And then after that, there's even the breakdown period and blah, 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 blah. Like we're going to be fighting this for the versions of this and remnants of this for decades. You know, but everybody wants the childhood fairy tale and the childhood fairy tale doesn't exist. It's a story and it's a story to help you understand what's happening. But we're going to be doing this. You and I, Pete, you and I, if we, you know, you know, by the, by the grace of the universe itself, we'll be, you know, we'll be lucky to be doing this 20 years from now. Right. And talking about some variation on all of this and how we've, you know, and how it's, how it's worked out. Because if not, then it's, you know, we're waiting for the, we're waiting for the flash. Yeah. Do me a favor humor me i want to end on this okay tell everybody why we went to the moon Mm. happily i want you to just two things before i answer that question i want to say i know because this is like part of the the conversation you and i had um when you when you passed through gainesville a couple weeks ago um I want everybody to really think about why it is all of a sudden that they've questioned the fact that they question this idea that we went to the moon, right? It's a thing. All of a sudden it's everywhere. 
right? Everybody. And we live in an age where we don't believe anything. Faith in government is failing. Faith in all of our institutions is failing. And I, part of me believes quite sincerely that that's part of the PSYOP. And that's part of the demoralization process. We can't believe anything. We can't believe in anything good, anything brilliant, anything big and greater than ourselves and, and all the rest of it. Like, you know, we're even to the point now where, you know, having to do revisionist history on why we fought World War II and the valor of the men who fought it and blah, 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 blah. Like it's, it's, it's all embedded there, right? So I just want you to, everybody listening to me on this, before you, you know, tell me what you think or what you don't think about how, whether we went to the moon or not, ask yourself the question of why it is, why is it all of a sudden that you're even asking yourself that question? Who put that idea in your head? Where did the inception for that idea come from? To to quote Chris Nolan, that even though it's not a movie of um one of my it's not one of my favorite movies of his, but the idea behind it is is actually interesting. But I'm gonna be honest with you. Here's the here's the simple answer. We went to the moon. Okay, you know why? Because we built the SR-71 Blackbird with a bunch of white guys with pocket protectors and slide rules. And the SR-71 as a fucking is the ninth wonder of the world. It's an airplane that is an unbelievable engineering marvel. And we built that thing and designed it in the 50s with white guys and pocket protectors with slide rules. If you don't think that we can't build a friggin' rocket and th stick three guys on a capsule on the top of a rocket and send their asses to the moon and bring them home, you're out of your mind. It's an, a far easier engineering feat than the SR-71 Blackbird, which leaks, which the, the airframe is doesn't, on the ground, can't function properly and is leaking fuel because in order to fly at Mach 9 on the edge of space, it it, it only works, it only tightens up and works if it's like leaking fuel and is on free. It's just an amazing thing. Go watch a, go watch a documentary on the SR-71 Blackbird and then come back to me and tell me that we could do that 10 years later, 12 years later, we could send a guy to the moon. And that Van Allen belt radiation isn't that big a deal. And, you know, like I, it's mostly beta radiation anyway. And hell, most of that is honestly, most of it is stopped by the oils on your skin. And I, I mean, I can go into this. Like there's a lot of, there's just a lot of lot here. And I just, I, you know, I, I, don't buy it. Do I buy that every image that we got from the moon is, 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 you know, ah, that's a good question. You know, is everything about the story, what we perceive, you know, what we were told, eh, there's probably some, you know, government propaganda in there somewhere in order to, you know, make it, make it all function. But the idea that we can't send people to the moon is crazy. I know. And I think where we are today um, is, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of people that, you know, don't want us to believe that we can dare greatly and do great things. I just think that that's part of the game. I think we live in a, I think we live in a series of overlapping demoralization psyops to make us think that we don't have any agency. We don't have any real political power. Uh, the world is, you know, you know, I mean, if you don't believe we went to the movie, you might as well believe the world is fucking flat too. I mean, why not? Go for it. I mean, if you like, if you believe in fairy tales, it's fine. I happen to want to believe in, you know, I, I have a, I have more faith in humanity than that. I just do. Well, okay. That's great. But Why? Did they want to go? Well, to the moon? Why did we go to the moon? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, then we start getting into the whole suspicious observers thing and the whole twelve thousand year disaster cycle, as to whether or not, you know, as we we pass through the plane of the galactic ecliptic and the and the dust storm and the and the dust that 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 exists equatorially within the within the galaxy, no different than why we have why Saturn's rings are equatorial around Saturn. It's just, a, it's just a function of, uh, of uh, Newtonian um, physics and Keplerian motion. Right. Um, 
that every 12,000 years we go through, you know, we, 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 we wobble through the, the solar system wobbles through across, you know, relative to the, the galactic ecliptic, the same way that the earth, you know, rotates back and forth, does this to create the seasons, right? Wobbles back and forth to create the seasons. Um, if we went to the moon purely to find out that, yeah, this potential that this, that there's a, I, I can make an argument that part of the reason why we went to the moon had nothing to do with national greatness and everything to do with proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that every so often the sun has to blow off a, an ugly shell worth of debris and it blasts it off. And then, and that the evidence is found in the moon that every 12,000 years. And again, you can go to suspicious observers. You can watch uh, Ben's, the, Ben's videos on this. And, and the, I think it's Douglas boat is the, uh, the guy who's been um, the most prominent guy to, 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 to put forth this series, this, this theory about micronovas. And I, again, I'm not sure that I believe any of this, but I'm willing to entertain it. And I'm willing to like, think about it because it does make some sense why would we go to the moon if we knew that we were getting close to that moment you know in in the in the in the history then we want to send some people to the moon to take friggin samples off the planet and then we off the, the surface of the moon and go and and we have the the astronauts on record going well we've got a bunch of count you know we've got a bunch of calcium carbonate rocks and a bunch of carbonate rocks we also have these like glassy things like this is like, and, and, you know, and heavy metals and space metals and all this shit. Like, where did this crap come from? Like, and it's consistent with the basic theory put forth about, you know, the sun having that, you know, that we get, that the sun gets basically dirty every 12,000 years or so. And it has to blast that shell off and it would blast it out across the solar system. And, you know, it's most of that stuff's going to burn up on our atmosphere. Most of it. But the evidence would be there on the moon. And if and we, brought were... the, and we brought those and we brought those back. Yeah, see, that's a better. This is a far better conspiracy theory than we didn't go. <laughs> In my mind, like that would make sense that we went. And then we found out. Oh, that's why we found out. And then we went and we proved it. And then we didn't go back. <laughs> it's like, ah! You know, but I yep. like I, I'm just playing. I'm just I'm playing devil's advocate here. Like I've I've heard these things. I find them interesting. I don't know that I believe them. Like please, I I. But I'm enough of a scientist to entertain ideas that I don't necessarily believe in, and it's a it's it's part of what I do geopolitically, financially, and you know, and all of it. Like it's what you. It's just intellectual curiosity, and then running an idea all the way to its end. You know, does it make me sound like a kook sometimes? Sure. What the hell? I don't, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. How does the theory of Catherine Austin Fitz work into this? <laughs> oh man, you're making me go all the way down the, the rabbit hole. So if we have a 12,000 year disaster cycle, we have things like Gobekli Tepe and, you know, all the stuff that, you know, all these underground civilizations and everything else that we have evidence of this and that we have a, if we have a disaster cycle where we know that 99% of the population is going to die, right. Then we have Catherine Austin Fitz out there, you know, screaming about the $40 trillion of, you know, off budget stuff that we can't account for. Right. Well, what if that money has been spent and it's been spent to, you know, build underground cities. To house a certain amount of humanity. Knowing full well that this, that, that, that you know, we know that the, the, the disaster is coming and we can't avoid it or, you know, and we might as well spend the money to, you know, have a opportunity for a certain amount of pop the population to survive. In effect, it's kind of like District 13 from the Hunger Games. They built an underground, they went underground in order to, to, to keep the capital from one, knowing about them and two, you know, um, yeah you know, keep from, you know, bombing them, uh, from getting bombed. Not that I, not that I think that the setup in the hunger games is anything other than the thinnest of world building, though. I happen to be a fan of the series, but from a world building perspective, it's, it's kind of thin, but that's a, that's a, that's just a, a storyteller's critique here. All right. So probably pissed off a lot of Europeans, Americans, Africans, middle Easterners, probably, an, yeah, 
probably Chinese as well, and then a whole bunch of conspiracy theorists. So um, I, th I think we're good. I, I think I think, <laughs> I, I think this is great. You're the, you're the, and I'll be honest with you, Pete. You're the only one that I would do this with. Um, everybody else would be like, yeah, I ain't, I ain't going here. Like, and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, like, I, again, folks, I, these are things that I, uh, that I investigate, that I talk, that I think about, that we, you know, am I, if I really believed in all this stuff, dudes, like I wouldn't be living in North Florida, right? Because, you know, I'd be like, I'd be building a bunker in, you know, Colorado or, you know, some other place that's going to survive the flood and, you know, the other, the rest of the disaster. But here I am, I still live in North Florida, you know, talk to me in two years and we'll see where we, you know, we'll see where I'm, I'm holed up from. But for right now, you know, it was a lovely spring day here in Florida. Remind everybody where they can find your work. Goldghostandguns.com. Um, TFL 1728 on Twitter, where, you know, if you thought this was, you know, weird, you should, you know, check out the Twitter feed because it's, you know, it's 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 a hoot. Um, and uh, Patreon, Patreon slash Gold Ghosts and Guns, where you can sign up for uh, either the twice weekly market reports and private blogs and podcasts, or you can also get the, the monthly investment newsletter where, you know, we have a portfolio strategy and, you know, all, um, all original material looking, trying to look ahead as to where we're, where we're headed. So that's what we do. And, uh, you know, we try and keep it, uh, I don't know. I try and keep it as real as possible, but every once in a while, you know, I have to go off into the, into the weeds, like, you know, Islamic eschatology and the moon. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> I don't know sure. how the hell you got me to talk about this shit this afternoon, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, FYI, my partner asked wants me to know last thing before we leave. Um, do you when when the next time you're on the show, do we have to make do you, he wants to know seriously, he's he's this is the way he is. Um, Tilda, in the name or not, do you care? Um I've I've started using it again just so that okay. it could try to help people you know who know just a little bit how to pronounce it properly even though i pronounce it at the beginning of every episode i still get people who just they're, they're, i mean and if you're not if you're like one of these people who was like uh, well I, I don't listen to the show i just skip past the beginning that's fine um but if you're one of these people who's like no i refuse to pronounce it pr pronounce it right i actually appreciate that better than you know not knowing how to do it <laughs> <laughs> that's fine i i will let them know that that uh you know yeah, that so, we'll, uh, so we'll make sure that in, in the future, anytime we intersect on, on with us, that you know that we spell the name properly with the tilde. Serious, honest to God, serious question, dude. I was asked, I was told this three or four times because he's that he's not much of a stickler for detail. Which how, is what how, I autistic, how autistic is he? Not at all. 